Good day. Uh, I hope those of you who are listening are in good health and safe and have access to the services you need. Uh, what I will do this today is to offer a what I'll call a Lenten reflection. It's about the season of Lent on the one hand, and it's about a feast we have just celebrated in the midst of Lent. March is always in the midst of Lent, and halfway through March, this past Wednesday on March 25th, we celebrated the feast that is called in the church the Annunciation. That commemorates the visitation of the angel to Mary to invite her to become the mother of God. But this is a feast that has always had two titles, the Annunciation and the Incarnation. Because, of course, when Mary said yes to God's invitation, then at that moment in time, the Son of God entered into human history as his conception began in the womb of Mary. It is the Incarnation that will be the substance of my Lenten reflection. The Incarnation many regard as the distinguishing doctrine of Christianity. God has entered the human in human form. And precisely because it is so important to us as Christians, as Catholics, I want to concentrate on what many call the Gospel of the Incarnation. The Gospel of the Incarnation is the Gospel of John. Now, to be sure, the Incarnation is found in all four Gospels. But as with other themes, one Gospel or another often highlights a theme in a particular way. And John's Gospel, in a particular way, is dedicated to the Incarnation. I will then move from John's reflection to what I'll call the theology of the Incarnation, particularly as it was developed in the middle of the 20th century. And then I'll move finally to a definitive expression of the meaning of the Incarnation in one of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, the document on the Church in the modern world. So let us turn to John and let us use John's words. John's Gospel opens this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not made anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. And so John's Gospel begins with this wonderful reflection that the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Son of God, entered into history and took human flesh lived a human life, experienced humanity and its life from the inside. 
And John runs this reflection on the Incarnation through his Gospel in many ways. And it extends also to the first epistle that John wrote, which follows the Gospel. But we need not trace all the reflection all the way through. What John is trying to tell us is that God entered the human because of us. Jesus explained that in the third chapter of John's Gospel when Jesus was in dialogue with the, Nicod with the Pharisee Nicodemus. And as Jesus tried to explain to Nicodemus the purpose of his ministry, he said to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world. And then Jesus, on his own behalf, said, And the Son has come not to judge the world, but to save the world. Throughout the Gospel, we hear about the body, bodily reality of Jesus, the material reality of Jesus' ministry. In the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus gives us a long meditation on the body of Christ, his reflection on the Eucharist. And what we draw from John's Gospel is that the ministry of Jesus, carried out in human form, is the legacy that he left to the Church that just as he entered the human and he used the things of the earth, water, bread, wine, oil, as he did those things, the legacy left to the church is that we should be committed to the salvation and the healing of the world, be committed not only to the ultimate salvation of the world, but be committed to healing the wounds of the world in our own time, and that we should use the things of the earth to communicate God's love and life to people of our time. And so we use bread and wine for the great gift of the Eucharist. We use oil to anoint the sick we are so conscious of that at this time. We use water to convey God's life to human beings in baptism. All of this and much more is found in John. The Word became flesh, and we have seen the face of God in the Jesus of Palestine. Catholicism has always found in the Incarnation a great truth. Not only the supreme truth that God's divinity was made available to the world, God's own life is given to us. But Catholicism uh, has always treasured ways of human expression of the presence of divinity in the world. That's what the cathedrals are about. They're not only great works of architecture. They are the human spirit seeking to express God's presence among us and our response to that presence by building the cathedrals and worshiping in them. We've always treasured in Catholicism great art. The Feast of the Annunciation, the Angel's Annunciation to Mary, has been the source of innumerable wonderful works of art. And so it is that we inherit this legacy, God revealed in the human and the human response to God. And as is the case in Catholicism, while the scriptures are the revealed word of God, we have always believed it was necessary to take the scriptures and to reflect upon them, to take the scriptures 
and to use the message we have been given in Revelation through the reflection of theology. What theology does, we are told, is that it is faith-seeking understanding. And so while always treasuring the revealed word as the center of our faith, we build around that treasure in a series of concentric circles reaching out across 2,000 years of reflection on the word, the application of it in our lives, the deepening of our understanding of the word in our spirituality. And so it is that theological reflection in Catholicism has been rooted and grounded in many ways in this great mystery of the Incarnation. Think of the way the term the body of Christ runs through our faith. We believe in the physical body of Christ, we believe in the sacramental body of Christ, and we believe in the spiritual body of Christ. The first, the physical body of Christ, is what John spoke of and is the beginning of our Christian faith. We believe in the man who was the Son of God, and our brother as Christ. We listen to his words, we watch his ministry, we are inspired to try to reflect his way of life in our way of life, the first meaning of the body of Christ. But the second meaning of the body of Christ is the body of Christ as the sacramental Christ, the Eucharist. The sacramental Christ was given to us on the night before Jesus died, when his ministry in earthly terms was drawing to an end, but when he wanted to be sure that the world understood that as he passed through his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension to the Father, he would not leave the world alone. And so we gather as often as we can to commemorate the words and deeds of Jesus in the Eucharist. The physical Christ has given us the sacramental Christ. And the sacramental Christ is to stay with us till the end of time. And I suspect all of us feel pretty deeply what is missing these days when we're not able to have access to the sacramental Christ. But I'll return to that at the end of my reflection, for we should bear with this trial in a special spirit. The physical Christ, the source of our faith, the sacramental Christ, the gift of Christ to us in time and space throughout history, and the sacramental Christ creates the body of Christ, which is the church. And the church itself is meant to carry forward the original work of Christ. In the middle of the 20th century, there were a number of Catholic theologians who reflected on this theme of the body of Christ, of the Incarnation of its meaning in a world so different than the world in which Christ himself lived. These theologians were remarkable people, significant in themselves, but doubly significant in the fact that what they wrote and taught in the period roughly between the 1930s and the 1960s, what they wrote and taught provided the raw material for much of the Second Vatican Council. It's not possible in the space we have to take you deeply into them as a whole, 
The French were particularly productive in this area. Father Yves Congar, a Dominican who really basically was the principal author of the document of the Church of the Second Vatican Council. A colleague of his, a Jesuit, Father André de Lubac, a remarkable man who was the voice of the French resistance in some ways during World War II, had been wounded in World War I and then went on to become a great theologian in the 1940s and 50s. And then a man that people know much less than the first two. Father Gustave Thiels was a, Domin was a Belgian who once wrote a book on the theology of material reality, the theology of things, if you will, and how we use them. Let me concentrate just for an example of how one of these people both wrote significant material on his own count and did so much to prepare for the Second Vatican Council. And that was Father Eve Congar, a Dominican priest who lived uh, into his 90s uh, and who had an extraordinary output. But one of his most remarkable books is maybe one that is not as well known as so much of the rest of his work. But it bears directly on this idea of theology reflecting upon the Incarnation. Congar wrote a small book called Christ Our Lady and the Church. And in that book, what he does is an extended reflection on the Incarnation. Congar's basic point is to hammer home the principle that God works through the human. God works out the salvation of the world through the human, not apart from it. Our faith is not about magic. Our faith is about the work that God does for us, with us, and through us. So, taking the principle that God works through the human, Congar then plays out the principle in three ways. Christ, Our Lady, and the Church. For him, each one of these is the principle at work. But of course there are differences in these three dimensional consequences of the Incarnation. God works through Christ and so we have in Christ this unique reality of full divinity and full humanity in one person. The Church expresses it in her faith by saying that Christ had a human nature and a divine nature combined in one person. We express our faith in this unique reality every Sunday in the Nicene Creed. When we recite the Creed, we are reciting one of the great documents of the Church, because it was based in a council of the Church in the 4th century, which was reacting to trends in the Church where there was confusion about divinity and humanity, and the Church had to clarify it. And we remember these phrases that we repeat every Sunday, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. We say these things quickly, but embodied in them are great truths, and theology gives us a time to reflect on them. So the first instance of God working through the human takes us back to the beginning of John's Gospel. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. And the world word became flesh 
and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. God works through the human. Without the humanity of Christ, there would be no crucifixion. Without the crucifixion and the resurrection, there would be no infusion of God's grace into the world. So as we read all four Gospels, we are watching God work through the human in the humanity and divinity of Christ. And then there is what Congar called Our Lady. The Dominicans are devoted to the Blessed Mother. The Dominicans gave us the rosary. And so the second stage of Congar's principle, God works through the human, is the way it worked through Mary. Now here, we have not a person who holds in one personality divinity and humanity the way Christ did. We have a fully human person, but a person who carried out a literally unique ministry in all of human history, and who the church, upon reflection, concluded that was never touched by sin. Not a divine person, but a human person of great faith who said yes to God and carried out this unique role. For if the humanity of Christ is necessary for the crucifixion and the resurrection, there is no humanity for Christ without Mary. God works through the human. And then the third level is God works through the church. The church is a combination of a fully human community that is blessed by God's grace, so we possess divine life, as Mary did, but we are not divine persons. We are sanctified persons, we are filled with divine life, and we are invited to grow into that life through our spirituality. But the church is human and divine in the sense that we believe it is divinely constituted and that it has the capacity, the duty, the mandate to communicate divine life to all those who come in faith to receive it. And as the church carries out that work by teaching, by the sacramental ministry, and by ordering a community dedicated to Christ, as the church does that, we use the things of the earth to communicate divine life to the human race. This theology of the Incarnation, the work of these multiple figures in the middle of the 20th century, took shape in several of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. But the document that perhaps most clearly reflects the theme of the Incarnation was the final document of Vatican II. The document is described, its title, The Church in the World of Our Time. And to some degree, it takes the tone and theme of what Jesus said to Nicodemus about his ministry. God so loved the world that he sent his Son into the world, and the Son who stands before you, Jesus said to Nicodemus, the Son has come not to judge the world, but to bring it to salvation. And so this document of the Second Vatican Council opens with the following paragraph. The joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the men and women of our time, especially of those who are poor 
or afflicted in any way are the joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community composed of men and women who, being united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit, press onwards toward the kingdom of the Father and are bearers of a message of salvation intended for all. That is why Christians cherish a feeling of deep solidarity with the human race and its history. Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis both have taught us that solidarity with each other and solidarity with all those in the human family are part of our vocation as Christians and Catholics. We carry it out in very different ways. No one person does everything. But the spirit of solidarity, especially responding in different ways to suffering, to anxiety, to human needs, to spiritual needs, we express solidarity. No one person does it all, but the church as a whole seeks to be a universal community, the body of Christ, committed to the healing of the world. And so the document of the Second Vatican Council calls the church to be, in a good sense, a worldly church, a church committed to the welfare of the world, a church committed to testify to the abiding presence of Christ in our own time. The Gospel of John, the theology of the 20th century, and the voice of the Council, all of those testify to the significance of the doctrine of the Incarnation. And so that leads me to one final set of reflections, our present moment. I am with you through this medium of social media as are so many that we are presenting, priests of the parish, other documents and moments of the parish. We are all here because we are in both a critical moment and a difficult moment. The crisis that surrounds us is what we face. What we remember is that God works through the human. This crisis is different than others we have faced. Many of us of a certain age lived through large parts of the 20th century, two world wars and the Cold War. There were challenges posed by that, dangers posed by that, but different than this crisis. Nor is this crisis purely about money, about financial affairs, such as we found in the financial crisis in the first decade of the new century. There can be financial consequences of this crisis, to be sure, that we're trying to avoid. But I submit that this crisis, a disease, is of a different kind. It's a different kind of challenge. Everybody is threatened. When we go to war, usually we pray for those who are at the front lines, but we're all not necessarily threatened. But in this crisis, we are all called to resist it. Ordinary things we're asked to do are still difficult. Sheltering, staying inside, keeping our distance, None of that is our instinctive reaction. But all of us are called. We are the actors that can make the difference. Some are uniquely called and should be in our prayers each day. The healthcare community who fulfill in this crisis the kind of role, honored role, 
we reserve for the military in war. We always remember in war. Valor, heroism, generosity. And we praise those who experience it and manifest it. We should do likewise today for the men and women of health care, the scientists trying to find a cure. All of them should be in our prayers and they should be our teachers. This disease is not God's work. God does tolerate an imperfect world in which many things happen that are not God's work. But our response to it is God's work expressed through us. And so if we take the principle that God works through the human, we are very much part of that large drama of that principle and of this crisis. And I suggest the gifts we need to work our way through this are faith, hope, science, and medicine. Faith and hope, the gifts of God to us. Faith teaches us we are never alone, whether it is war or catastrophe or disease. We face this with the abiding presence of God. For Christ has left us the signs of his continued presence to us in the sacraments. Hope. The meaning of hope is the ability to confront reality in all its dimensions and not be overwhelmed by it. And so hope provides a strength that goes beyond purely human capacity. But faith is the foundation of hope, and hope comes with faith, and faith and hope are the divine gifts that help us. Science and medicine testify to a deep Catholic truth, that faith and reason are complementary. Faith is not opposed to reason, and reason is not opposed to faith, and in this crisis, why we surely should pray in our faith, rely on our hope, we also look to, rely upon, and pray for, and listen to, and learn from what science and medicine can tell us. In a sense, I suppose, if this crisis had to come, Lent is a a time that may help us too. In Lent we think about discipline and there are different kinds of disciplines that we choose in our Lenten experience. This whole experience means that we are burdened with a discipline and so there is a, a kind of, if I can call it, fittingness if it has to happen that it would happen in Lent. But Lent always ends in Easter, when hope is once again renewed. Our discipline is rewarded, and our faith tells us that in this crisis, at the end of Lent, there is Easter, not so much in a temporal meaning of one given Sunday, but that every Easter as the Church celebrates the feast, even if it is with the Holy Father celebrating with no congregation, or Cardinal Sean doing the same, or parishes doing it online, when we celebrate that feast, our hope will be renewed, and our prayer, ultimately, we are convinced by our faith, will be heard. Thank you.